Okay, 25. Come on. It's hard to do 37 cases in an hour, guys, and I'm, I'm talking as fast as I can. This looks good for another uh, nevus sebaceous. Yeah, this is a, a much more subtle nevus sebaceous. The epidermis is barely acanthotic at all, but you do have sebaceous glands underneath, and they are emptying directly to the surface. So just a good example of the, the range of features you can see in nevus sebaceous. They're not always so florid and beautiful as that first one. They can be subtle. Number three. This looks like nevus sebaceous. Yeah, it's as classic as you can get, right? The epidermis is acanthotic, and in my view, it looks kind of like a seb or a wart, seborrheic keratosis or verruca on the surface. And then if your patient is not, if they're in puberty or later, they'll usually have these big sebaceous glands that are mature and that open, unlike normal sebaceous glands, which open into follicles, these sebaceous glands open directly to the surface of the skin, which is abnormal, right? And uh, that's a perfect example you can see right there. And then the other thing that you'll have in some cases, not always, is the presence of either apocrine glands, like right here, look at those beautiful apocrine snouts. And apocrine glands, or apocrine, whatever name you, whatever word you like, they have these like very nice round nuclei with prominent nucleoli. So that's one way, if you can't see good snouts and you're wondering, are those really apocrine? Go look, do they look like little eyeballs, like little minion, you know, the little minion cartoons, like the one with the one eye? Uh, that's what someone on Instagram told me that once. They're like, it looks like minions. And I was like, oh, they so do. And I think that's really fun. So in any case, um, the other thing is that in Nevis sebaceous, you don't always have um, full-blown apocrine glands. Sometimes they kind of have an overlap. They look like eccrine coils, but with a little bit of that apocrine nuclear change or snouting, the decapitation snouts, you know. Um, and uh, that is, those are called apoecrine glands. They kind of have an overlap. But I find that really useful because apocrine glands normally are where? Like the anogenital areas uh, around the nipples. You can see them on the, the eyelid margin, the glands of mole. M-O-L-L, -L, those are uh, modified apocrine glands, if I recall. And, um, and so in any case, if you see on the scalp uh, apocrine glands in the dermis, you're probably dealing with a nevus sebaceous. And some nevus sebaceous is not as floridly papillomatous. Sometimes the um, sebaceous glands are not as big and well-developed, particularly in kids or that are before puberty. And the other thing I find helpful is here we're on scalp with these huge antigen hairs with their roots down in the subcutis. And then all of a sudden, the hair is gone. No hair, no hair, no hair. And then on the other side of the lesion, the hair comes back. And that is analogous to what you see clinically, that you see this greasy kind of warty plaque without hair growing in it usually. So I find the lack of hair in, the, in a scalp region, which is the most common site for nevus sebaceous, I find that lack of hair to be very useful actually in making the diagnosis. As you guys know, you can have a wide variety of adnexal um, proliferations and neoplasms that arise in the background of nevus sebaceous. Um, and... Um, Rarely you can have carcinomas grow there, but most things in these that look like carcinoma, if they look like a basal cell carcinoma, probably actually a trichoblastoma. That's kind of my view, and I think I think most people are now in agreement on that, although not everybody. So in any case, very nice nevus sebaceous, and it's a form of hamartoma, and epidermal nevus is a closely related uh, entity.